to Inside the Middle East. I'm Hala Garani in Manama, the capital of Bahrain. Well, it's a relatively cool and windy spring night in this Gulf country. Temperatures can certainly get a lot hotter than this. We're in the Bahrain Museum, an annex that is a cultural fair where families are enjoying an evening night out. There's cotton candy and things for sale and various stalls here and there. Now, if Bahrain is known for one thing around the world, it's that it is a very rich country. In fact, per capita GDP is one of the highest in the world, thanks in large part to the oil boom. But some people in Bahrain complain that there is a large portion of the population here that has not benefited from economic growth. A large portion of the population, they say, is hidden and not talked about. And that is the topic of our first story on Inside the Middle East. Take a look. The story for this edition of Inside the Middle East was supposed to be about poverty in the Persian Gulf. In a city like Manama in Bahrain, visitors usually see this. Skyscrapers piercing the blue sky, expensive cars, once a year, the exclusive Formula One race on Bahrain's brand new racetrack. But drive out a few miles and you sometimes see this. Decrepit housing, run-down and dirty streets in mainly Shiite villages that have not benefited from Bahrain's economic boom. The plan was to report on poverty in Bahrain, but almost immediately it becomes obvious this is a story about long-standing tensions between the majority Shia and the ruling Sunni class here. Inside this house I talk with the head of a Shia family who says two of his sons are unemployed. The presence of our camera gets everyone going. The mother chimes in, and then a young Shiite man, so candid in his tirade against the Sunni prime minister, I'm taken aback. How do you see your future? My future, it's like my present, that's what I think. So not good? There is no future. If Khalifa bin Salman here in country, there is no future. Let him to listen, let him to know. What is this life? It's his bad life, really, it's bad life. We need something good for us. Now, are you afraid that if you say this and it appears on camera that... I don't care about them. Let him see anything what they want to see. If I have something want to do, I will do. I'm not afraid about it. Is it okay if we use this on TV? Yeah, of course, you can put it in Bahrain channel also, no problem. Bahrain has been ruled by a Sunni monarchy for more than 200 years, first as a British protectorate and since 1971 as an independent Gulf state. But these Shiites say the story is not about poverty, but about systematic discrimination against them. Hanging on the walls of this house, pictures not of Bahrain's king, but of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. And he showed the receipt Nabil Rajab is one of the heads of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. His office was closed by the government in 2004. He says he was beaten and harassed. Rajab is Shiite, like up to three quarters of the people in Bahrain. But the Shia discrimination against the Shia is in all, it's not only in government now, it started that happening on the companies owned by the government. I think that goes back to they want to make sure that the Shia stays in that very low, very low. They don't want them to be economically empowered. As always, our royal family and our government have fears that this, those Shia could take over the government one day. So I visit government officials in Bahrain. The housing minister Fahmi Ben Ali Al Jadr says those who complain of discrimination are ignoring official efforts to alleviate poverty across sectarian lines. Look at how much the government have done in the country in terms of housing from the period 1975 until 2001. It developed around 44,500 units. In the period from 2002 until 2006, the government developed and provided service to another 14,000 families. So this is almost everyone in Bahrain. So if, if, you, if you come and say, well, the government didn't do much, I think it is unfair. Bin Ali al Jadr says that tens of thousands of housing units are being built for the poor right now, 
and that the government must encourage people to work rather than rely on financial assistance. I'm told that day that there will be a demonstration in a Shiite village. Protesters have been gathering every week, I'm told, to demand better living conditions and jobs. Sometimes the demonstrations become violent. Today, it did not. Protesters say Shiites are kept out of top government jobs, that they're not allowed to serve in the army or the police, that the Sunni-dominated government brings people from other Sunni countries, like Syria and Jordan, instead of hiring Bahraini Shiites. Is poverty a result of discrimination? I asked the Minister of Social Affairs about accusations the government does not employ its own citizens. At the end, uh, businessmen, when they come, they say, okay, we try to employ Bahrainis, but they do not stay. They don't like those jobs. They don't want hard-working jobs. Uh, they prefer having a job in an office. Sectarian frustration has existed for years in Bahrain. In the early 90s, some Shia demonstrators were jailed here. In the village of Bani Jamra, Sadiq Fatil says he can't afford to move out of this house on his salary from a nearby slaughterhouse. He shows me the home he shares with his wife and son and the horse he keeps in the back field. His family used to grow their own food here until, he says, land was reclaimed by the government to build real estate on the shore. On the way back to the hotel, we stop at a sports field in the village, shooting hoops with local kids Whoa! on a broken basketball goal. <laughs> My story over, I drive back to the glossy Bahrain most visitors usually see. Coming up next on Inside the Middle East, she is unique in the Arab world. And she has a talk show where she discusses surprisingly intimate issues. Stay with us.